Before we get started today, I just want to tell you about two new channels that I'm involved in. And I think you might enjoy these channels if you enjoy watching Landum C. Goes There. For Real Fiction is a channel much like Landum C. Goes There, except it focuses more on late 70s, 80s, and 90s material. But it's the same general format as the current channel. And the other channel is called Recollection Road. And this channel is a stroll down memory lane looking at snapshots of the past. I think you might enjoy these channels. Take a look at them. I'll provide links for you in the description of this video. And as always, thanks so much for watching the videos. Now let's get in to the video for today. Ever since its release in July of 1952, Stanley Kramer's High Noon, starring Gary Cooper, has been acknowledged and recognized as one of Hollywood's greatest westerns. For almost 70 years, High Noon has rooted itself in our culture and into our national consciousness. The screenplay by Carl Foreman deviated drastically from what moviegoers would have expected in a western movie of that time. Confronting an emotional dialogue basically replaced barroom brawls. Also, a lawman's walk down a deserted street was replaced by horseback riding through breathtaking big sky country. This departing from the usual, along with Gary Cooper's compassionate, down-to-earth portrayal, contributed largely to the film's success. Now, the movie's plot is so simple and basic but it's presented in a unique and profound way. On the very day Marshal Will Kane gets married and hangs up his badge, he is told that Frank Miller, a man he sent to prison years before, is returning on the noon train to exact revenge on him. He's initially leaving town with his new bride, but Will decides he must go back and face Miller. When he seeks the help of the townspeople who he's been protecting for years, they all, except a drunk and a young boy, turn their backs on him. It appears Kane alone will have to face Miller and three of his gang members, all awaiting him at the station. It's interesting that the running time of the story closely parallels the running time of the film. The director, Fred Zinnemann, perfectly enhances this throughout the film with his frequent shots of clocks. This effect, time and time again, reminds not only the characters, but also the audience that the villain will be arriving on the noon train. The leading role of Marshal Will Kane was offered to Gregory Peck. He turned it down because he thought it was too similar to his role in The Gunfighter that he did just the year before. He would later admit, though, that it's probably one of the biggest mistakes of his career. Marlon Brando, Montgomery Clift, and Charlton Heston also declined the roles. After making four poorly received films in 1950 and in 1951, Gary Cooper was actually seeing his career begin to fade. He was in the middle of a lucrative deal with Warner Brothers that paid him $275,000 for a picture a year. But after his great run in the early 40s, he was being offered increasingly uninspiring roles. Now, Cooper knew a good part when he saw one, and he loved the High Noon script. His lawyer let Kramer know that he'd be willing to play the role for $100,000. Both Kramer and Foreman saw Cooper as a product of the old-time studio system, which they just disdained. Even considering that, he did bring authenticity and a box office name to the film. The deal was done, and Foreman was left with the job of putting together the rest of the cast for a total of only $30,000. One of the reasons that Cooper took the role was because it represented what his father, who was a Montana State Supreme Court Justice, had taught him. And that was the fact that law enforcement was everybody's job. Throughout the filming of the movie, there is a noticeable pained look on Cooper's face. Stomach ulcers and back problems 
were plaguing him at this time. He was in extreme pain the day they shot the wedding scene when he had to actually pick up Grace Kelly. He wore no makeup to emphasize the character's anguish and fear, which was probably intensified by the pain from his recent surgery to remove bleeding ulcers. Unfortunately, at this time also, his personal life was just a mess. He was separated from his wife. His very public affair with Patricia Neal was coming to a very quick end. No wonder he looked so weary and drained in this film. Now, producer Sam Kramer actually saw Grace Kelly in an off-Broadway play in Denver, Colorado. He arranged a meeting with her, and he signed her and cast her on the spot as Kane's bride Amy. And this was done despite the difference in age between the two characters. Grace Kelly was just 21, but she was already an experienced stage performer, and she had been in one small part in a movie. Kramer really liked her looks and the fact that she was willing to work for just $750 a week. Now, she actually confesses that she was unhappy with her performance. She felt that she was too stiff and constrained as the character Amy Kane. However, the director thought her on-screen inexperience was very appropriate for the role and that it worked perfectly for this character. Lee Van Cleef made his film debut in this picture. He was originally hired to play the deputy marshal Harvey Pell, but Kramer actually decided that his nose was too hooked. This made him look more like a villain than a lawman. When he was told to get his nose fixed, Lee refused. He was given the smaller role of gunman Jack Colby, one of the Miller gang members. Lloyd Bridges was given the part with the help of his friend Gary Cooper. The actor who portrays Frank Miller's brother Ben in one form or another, has appeared in more movies than any other actor in High Noon. His name is Shelby Woolley, and all this is due to a recording of his yelping scream from another movie. That movie was Distant Drums. That scream was so good that it was saved as stock sound effect for Hollywood. It's commonly known as the Wilhelm scream and it got its name after the character in the third film that the sound was used in. As of July 2018, it had been used some 386 times in a variety of blockbuster movies, television shows, cartoons, and video games. High Noon was filmed in the late summer, early fall of 1951, and it was done in several locations around California. The movie was meticulously shot in just 32 days. For many who made the film, it seemed like an afterthought, a basic rush job, that it was really just trying to fulfill the end of an old contract between Stanley Kramer Productions and United Artists. The director's diligent planning enabled him to make 400 shots in only four weeks. He initially tried color, but didn't like the way the film looked after the first few scenes were filmed. They started over again in black and white, and as it turned out, the smoggy skies of Los Angeles appear totally white in the black and white, providing a great contrast to Will Kane's black clothes. The number of close-ups that the director gave Grace Kelly supposedly infuriated co-star Katie Gerardo, and it actually prompted her to accuse him of being half in love with her. Now, John Wayne was originally offered the lead role in the film. He turned it down because he felt that Carl Foreman's screenplay was an obvious allegory against the McCarthy blacklisting, which he had actively supported. John Wayne actually called this film the most un-American thing that I've ever seen in my whole life because it portrayed the townspeople as cowardly. Six years later, he would team up with director Howard Hawks to make Rio Bravo 
in response to this movie. This plot was similar to High Noon, but it was one where the sheriff never shows any fear or self-doubt. Howard Hawks said, I made Rio Bravo because I didn't like High Noon. Neither did Duke Wayne. Gary Cooper would go on to win the Best Actor Oscar for his performance at the 25th Annual Academy Awards in March of 1953. Since he was working in Europe at the time, he asked his good friend John Wayne to accept the award on his behalf. Ironically, when he collected Cooper's Oscar, he actually complained that he wasn't offered the part himself. Now, I don't know what that was actually about. I think it was more just a joke. But who knows? Only John Wayne would really know the story. The influence and the impact of this motion picture is immeasurable. Just the title itself, High Noon, has been forever romanticized. It signifies that moment when a good individual must confront evil. Its plot and story as well has been either partially or completely redone countless times in film. If it's been a while since you saw this movie, take a look at it again. I think you'll really enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching and we'll continue to chase the classics.